Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning here at Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. Do we have any first time guests? Uh, okay, and we've so you've got one of our lovely brochures here. Okay, good. All right, well, with that being said, let's go before the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless the service as the worship team makes their way up here. So, Lord, we come before you, and God, we're so grateful for this day. God, we're so grateful for who you are. Lord, I pray now as uh, we get ready to worship you through song, Lord, that you would anoint the worship team. Lord, that you would take the distractions away. You would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. So, Lord, we ask your blessing upon the service now. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel. We're so glad that you're all here this morning. Uh, why don't we all stand if you're able, and we will sing some songs as soon as Noah gets up here. I like that stall tactic. Isn't God good this morning? How about that beautiful sunny, I know, it's kind of unheard of here, sunshine yesterday. Wasn't that a gorgeous day? I don't know about you, but I am ready for that awful stuff that keeps falling out of the sky to be over with for a while. Falling? <laughs> rain. Oh. Yeah. But we're going to just pray that the Lord would rain His Spirit down upon us this morning as we worship Him. Amen? Amen. <laughs> just kidding. All right, let's try that again. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Sing it out to the Lord this morning. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. Oh, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the
conquered the grave. What a reason to worship God this morning. Amen. Feel free to re remain standing or take a seat however you feel most comfortable this morning. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. So come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So leave behind your regrets. Who oh, come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. So bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, Bear 
your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. Please join me in prayer as we pray for the tithes and the offerings. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful of who you are, for your grace, your mercy, and your love. All good things come from you. We want to give willingly, lovingly, some of what you've given to us in return to you. We pray that you'll bless these tithes and offerings and that the leadership will be able to use them to further your kingdom, Lord. We praise you and worship you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. truth that is I was sharing with first service you know what his love never ever fails it never gives up I don't care what 
you brought in with you this morning, what kind of sorrow, maybe, um, maybe you're depressed, maybe you uh, have no hope, his love will never fail you. It will never give up on you. It's greater than anything in our lives. It's greater than any sin in our life. It's greater than any failure in our life, any struggle. The love of God is far greater than any of those things. Amen. 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 Yeah, that's worth a hand clap for the Lord. All right, if the kiddos could come on down. All right, all right. Anybody else? Come on down. There's plenty of room up here. We need all of you. Come on, Dad. <laughs> all right. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great and how awesome is He Together we sing Everyone sing your hands we will pray for these children father we lift our children up to you lord we pray a blessing upon them god we pray that you would speak boldly through your word this morning through anything done in the sunday school rooms lord we pray for the nursery we pray for all just any any uh, ministry happening this morning that you would be glorified god that you would speak to our hearts speak to the children's hearts this morning lord we pray protection over their minds and God, that the word of God would dwell richly in their hearts and minds this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So take a second and greet somebody this morning. So just a few announcements that we have. Coming up on the 28th and the 29th is the men's conference in Klamath Falls. 
If you would like to attend, there is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer, uh, or you can come talk to me afterwards and I can give you more information about it. Then also our next Bible Basics class will be May 1st at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. So if you have any questions about that, you can speak to Pastor Aaron and he can give you all the information. Then also we have a Mother's Day brunch coming up on May 13th. So ladies, it's an opportunity for you to come and be spoiled and for you men, um, it's an opportunity for you to love on the ladies of the church and spoil them. So, um, so we both would love the ladies to be here and we'd love the men to come volunteer. And uh, if we don't get enough men to volunteer, then we'll start voluntarily telling men to come. So, so either way, you might as well sign up while you can. And then lastly, after second service on May 7th, we have a baby shower for Cheyenne. So it will be at 1.30 uh, upstairs. So if you have any questions about that, you can talk to my wife. Hi, Linda, back there. You're not Linda, not even close. Don't ever, <laughs> don't ever raise your hand again in that situation. Okay, we're gonna to try to get serious now. Are you guys ready? Okay, let's pray. Lord, we come before you and God, uh, once again, we're just so grateful for who you are. We're grateful for the joy that you give us. So Lord, as we continue in worship, just bless the time that we have as we worship you in spirit and in truth. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen.
just lift our voices and sing that chorus to the Lord this morning? So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Amen. All right. Well, as most of you know, we there's kind of a clue up there, isn't it, that we're in the book of 1 Corinthians. And um, we've been in the book of First Corinthians since last January, January of 2022. And we're going to finish it up today. And it's kind of interesting, as I was studying through uh, this last chapter, you know, we've been in chapter 15 for, I don't know, probably two months. And as we went through chapter 15, you know, it addressed some heavy spiritual issues, didn't it? It addressed, you know, really the hope of our faith, the reason for our faith. In fact, you know, it really, not only did it give us the gospel in chapter 15, where Paul said, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then in 15, chapter 15, Paul went on to give proofs of the re um, resurrection, right? All those that seen it. At the time of that this letter was being written, he's saying, you know what? There's hundreds of people that witnessed the resurrection of Christ, go ask them. You don't have to take my word for it. Go ask them. You know, and then he gave us the power of the resurrection and what the resurrection meant in the life of the believer, right? And then, you know, uh, then he talked about the rapture of the church. You know, we serve a living God who's coming back for us someday, amen? And, and so, you know, with Paul, we have... Uh, this really, he gives us the really spiritual meat of our walk and, and what it means to be a Christian and the power of it through the resurrection. And then after chapter 15, obviously comes chapter 16, and he completely switches gears. He goes from the eptone, you know, the kind of the pinnacle of the Christian faith and why we believe what we believe. The most important event and, you know, in the history of our faith, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, signifying that we uh, worship a living God, right? Because the tomb is empty. And so we go from that, then he goes to practical matters. <clears throat> he says, okay, we've got all the spiritual out of the way, and we've talked about it for a long time. Now we're going to talk about those practical matters. We're going to talk about those things that really, on a day-to-day -day basis, make the church run. You know, and he'll get into them. And, and because, let's face it, you know, before we can really um, do the spiritual work, there's a lot of practical stuff that goes on uh, to make a church service operational, right? There's... There's the worship team practice. There's the cleaning of the church. There's the arranging of, of the sanctuary. You know, and for instance, on Wednesday, there's, there's cooking that has to be done and, and tables put out and all the different things that need to be done just to make a service work. So there's a lot of practical stuff, right? Because if we ignored the practical stuff, uh, it would be chaos, even more chaos than it already is, right? And so he gets into this, you know, he goes from just the, the, the glorious, uh, you know, uh, promises that we have because of the resurrection to the practical. And we'll see that. But we know, you know, uh, I love these quotes speaking of that. It says, the resurrection of Jesus changes the face of death of all of his people. Death is no longer a prison, but a passage into God's presence. Easter says you can... Put truth in a grave, but it won't stay there. And then in another quote, when he's talking about the spiritual, uh, Clarence Hall says, Easter says you can put truth in a grave, but it won't stay there. You can nail it to a cross, wrap it in winding sheets, and shut it up in a tomb, but it will rise. Right? And, and so that's the spiritual part. Now, 
on that, he goes into the practical part. He was saying, so he begins with the first two verses here in 1 Corinthians. And we'll read them and then we'll pray one more time asking God's blessing and then we'll get into it. But it says in the first two verses, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come. So let's go before the Lord. Lord, as we enter into your word in 1 Corinthians 16, God, we just ask for wisdom and discernment, God, that you would just uh, light up your scriptures to us, Lord, that you would just give us all wisdom and understanding. Lord, be with us now. And Lord, as I always pray, I pray that you would give us the courage to be doers of your word and not hearers only. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So, you know, so he begins with the practical thing. Like I said, he went from the last thing he talked about from was the rapture to now taking a collection for the, the Jerusalem church. And he says, now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order, orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, Something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come. He's saying, hey, you know, the church in Jerusalem is hurting. The church in Jerusalem needs our help. You know, the church in Jerusalem needs to see our love because, you know, the church in Jerusalem was totally different than the church in Corinth, wasn't it? You know, you had the church in Jerusalem, which was more of a, uh, you know, was based on the Jewish culture and they had a lot of the legalism of, of the Jewish faith in it. And they almost looked down on some of the churches like Antioch and, and I'm sure the Corinthian church where, where you know, it was the Gentile, more Gentile based and, you know, they were kind of uh, worshiping the Lord with all the grace that they felt they had, right? And, and those in Jerusalem kind of scorned them like, you know... You heathens, are you even saved? You know, you're not circumcised. You're not all these things. You know, you need to be all these things if you really want to be saved, right? And so it was, they were a little wilder. And let's face it, the church in Corinthians was wild anyways. We've seen it over the last year and a half. They had issues, right? And so Paul was having the church there in Corinthians gather, uh, you know, taking a collection for the saints that were suffering in Jerusalem. And it's a beautiful picture uh, for us, too, to realize that it's not just all about Calvary Chapel Grant's past. You know, God's kingdom is much greater than that, right? The church right across the street from us and any Bible-believing church that is orthodox in their belief of who Jesus is, et cetera. They're all a part of the family, you know? And if one of us suffers, then we all suffer, right? So it was one of those things, we're gonna show love to the church in Jerusalem, even though they haven't always showed us love. You know, we're gonna show them that they're our brethren and we love them. And I love that about it, you know? And so the other thing about it is they're talking about it, it says on the first day of the week, you know, and it's worth mentioning here that the, the early church, it appears, you know, worshiped on the first day of the week, you know, on Sunday. They did it because that's the day that our Lord uh, rose, right? It was on the first day of the week. And we see it in other places also in Scripture. For instance, in Acts 20, verse 7, it says, Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to, part, to, to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. I know it's saying on the first day of the week, right? So they were worshiping on the first day of the week, breaking bread together. And I love this where it says, uh, and they continued his message until midnight. So if I continued my message to midnight right now, <laughs> Y'all would check out, I guarantee it. We, you know, it's a little different culture or you'd be sleeping anyways. I've got people back there raising their hands. Amen, I would check out of here. You're right. <laughs> it's noted, I'll deal with you later. But anyways, <laughs> you, uh, you know, it, it's true though. You know, it's like, so they were worshiping God on, on Sunday morning because they understood the power of the resurrection and that's when they wanted to worship, right? You know, there's other 
Um, people who are, you know, the Jews, they would worship him on the Sabbath, right, on, on, on Saturday. Okay, that's great. Uh, but us as, as Christians, we have the freedom and the grace, you know, not to be um, stuck by one day or another to worship the Lord. I love what Paul says in Romans 14, verse 5. It says, one man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. You know, this is, this is the way we should be, you know, that we, uh, we esteem every day alike, right? Because they're all the Lord's. So we shouldn't be worshiping him just on Sunday. No, we should be worshiping the Lord every day of the week, right? Because with our lives, with, you know, with who we are, we should esteem every day the same. Because like I said, God's given them all to us. You know, so we don't have to be, we don't have to be pigeonholed into one particular day. No, you know what? Uh, God is worthy of praise on Thursday as much as he is on Sunday or Tuesday as much as he is during our Wednesday service. It doesn't matter. You know, we should esteem every day alike, right? That as, as believers in uh, understanding who God is and his grace that's been poured upon our lives, um, we have the freedom to worship him every day. You know, and we understand, uh, you know, that the Sabbath was given to the Jews, right, as a, as a sign of their covenant. And we read that in Exodus chapter 31. It says, speak also to the children of Israel, saying, surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you and throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. So, you know, this was specifically given to the Jews, right? And, you know, there are those who really feel like Saturday is the day they should worship. Great. You know, but don't hold me to that same standard, because like Paul said in Romans 14, 5, you know, I, I esteem every day the same. All of them should be the Lord's. And not only that, but if you're going to, you know, follow, uh, you know, worshiping on the Sabbath, that's great. But then follow the rest of these verses. Don't do any work on it. And, you know, um, and if you miss it, you're going to be put to death. So that's what it says here, right? So follow the whole verses, not just part of it, you know. But no, the point is, is we have the freedom, obviously, um, because of our relationship and because of what Christ did for us on the cross. It's not about a day. It's not about legalism. It's about worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And as it continues on to finish the thought in Exodus, it says, work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall, be, shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. And so once again, it was a covenant. You know, it was a covenant with the Jewish people. It, was a, uh, it wasn't a sign that was given to the Gentiles, was it? We don't have that. You know, the, uh, we have a special covenant, uh, you know, in God's grace, don't we? And it's signified by the cross and the finished work of what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, and praise God for that, that that's the case. You know, we don't have to worry about all that. We know we worship on the, we come together here. We gather together on the first day of the week because that's the power of our belief that we serve a living God, that he rose on the first day of the week. You know, and so that's one of the reasons why we gather together here. But not only should we be gathered together here to worship God, but we should be gathering together every day of the week, you know, because ultimately um, the Friday service out the Refuge Center is just as important, if not more important, than the Sunday morning service, because that's where, that's in the middle of the darkness, right? That's where the lost come to, you know, on that Friday night service, it can get wacky sometimes. And I love it. You know, you have, you'll have people who have been drinking, you know, stumbling into the service. You'll have people who are slightly out of their mind, you know, coming in and in the middle of service. And, and but that's beautiful. You know, God placed us 
in that area, right in the midst of it, uh, to minister to those who, uh, you know, otherwise wouldn't come to this church. But they'll come to go to the food bank. They'll come to, um, you know, they'll smell the barbecue and come over for, you know, a free meal. Then we can feed them spiritually, right? Because there's nothing that attracts people like the burning flesh of barbecue, right? <laughs> you know, we can have all the signs and all of the wonderful music and all of these different things, but I guarantee you, you put on some steaks on the grill, they'll come, <laughs> right? You know, it, it's, just, it's just a truth. And, and that's not to manipulate people, but what it does do, it provides us an opportunity to love on them. It provides us an opportunity to feed them. And then it gives us a right to speak, the, you know, uh, speak into their lives, right? And so that's what it's all about. And, and that's what we do. So like I said, that is just as important as the first day of the week when we gather to here, right? We come here to be equipped and to encourage each other. Then we should be taking that out and worship God through serving others in the community and, and reaching the lost and engaging those that are out there, right? And so that's kind of what we do. That's the way that we do it. And so as, uh, as we see here, and as Paul goes on back in the 1 Corinthians, not only was he worshiping on the first day of the week, but I like how he, once again, you know, like I said, he is practical. He said, hey, we need to take a collection up for the saints. And in verse 2, it says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as you may prosper, that there may be no collections when I come. You know, he's saying, you know, this is give and just give freely, right? This is one of those things where you have the opportunity as God has prospered you, give back to the church. You know, it's one of those ideas, uh, like I said, of the universality of the church, of the true church. You know, we need to bless them. They're hurting. Let's get on board. Let's help them. Let's move on. Let's uh, let's help them with their, while they're suffering, um, you know, uh, they need our help. Uh, let's bless them. And then as he continues on in verse 3 with this thought, and it says, When I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. You know, the word gift, like I said, is the free giving, you know, that idea of just giving freely without remorse, without, you know, um, being, uh, you know, kind of guilted into giving or, you know, one of those things where as the collection thing comes by, you have the elder over there going, nope, that's not enough. Let's try again. <laughs> Getting a little better. Let's try again. Or, or you know, uh, well, the doors will remain locked until we reach our goal of so much ties. No, that's not what it's about. You know, it's saying that, you know, what you f can freely give. Because that's, you know, and that's why in this church, you never hear us talk about giving, right? We don't, we don't necessarily, unless it comes up in scripture, we teach it, that's why we teach verse by verse through the Bible, right? As the subject comes up and as God sees fit, we talk about whatever it is, no matter how comfortable or uncomfortable it is. We just strictly go through the Bible. And it's the same here, you know, um, you won't hear us come up with some kind of giving program, you know, or, or whatever the case may be. No, what we will do is, as you'll remember, and one thing I promised when I took over uh, being the senior pastor here was there would be transparency as far as the finances go. So once quarterly or so, the treasurer gives a report of where we are financially. I think that's great. It helps keep the board accountable uh, and to show you guys what we're doing with the finances. And based on that, you guys see what's going on in the church. You see you know, that, of course, We've struggled over the last couple of years financially. But with that, what we see even more than that is that we see the fruit of what God's doing in this church. And we see what's going on here. You know, I'm not called to be an accountant. I don't know what any of you tithe, but, you know, we're, I'm called to be a fruit inspector. And I see lots of fruit in this church. And with the rest of that, I know God will provide, you know, for those areas that, you know, that we kind of, uh, kind of like the Church of Jerusalem uh, is lacking in. You know, uh, this is God's church and he'll provide. So that's why you'll never hear us try to guilt 
anyone in the giving or whatever. It's no. You know, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, it says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, uh, may have an abundance for every good work. You know, I was saying, you know what? There's a spiritual concept here. You know, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap uh, sparingly, right? He's saying God loves a cheerful giver, not one who gives grudgingly, right? And so this doesn't just apply financially, but it's true. If you can't give uh, whatever it is cheerfully, you know, the, the term there is, uh, you know, um, the Lord loves a hilarious giver, one who's excited about giving, right? If you can't do that, I don't care if it's your finances, your time, your talents, whatever. If you can't do it cheerfully, then don't do it. It doesn't, it's, doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do the church any good. And God's not going to give you any credit for it. So if you're serving and it's like, oh, I don't really want to do this. I'm just whatever. Don't do it. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But if you can do it cheerfully, then please do. You know, God will bless it. You know, it's all about our heart, isn't it? So once again, that's why you'll never hear us set up here and go, okay, you sinners, you need to give more of your time. You need to volunteer more or whatever. No, well, all that we ever say is, hey, there's this opportunity. If you'd like to serve, serve, you know, but we're not going to force anybody or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, like it says, in the verse up a little where it says that, you know, uh, given out of need, right? No, we're not going to say, well, if you don't give, God's going to go broke. So you need to give or it's your fault. No, you know, we trust in God. You know, this is his, we always say it's his church and, it, you know, and he's going to provide for it one way or another. Amen. Amen. So then as it continues on, it says, but if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me, you know, to, to deliver the money to Jerusalem, right? Paul was planning on going. He wanted to take the, um, the offering from these Gentile churches and take it to Jerusalem. He wanted to be a part of being able to, to bless them, right? Because Paul had been dealing with the Corinthian church and he had wrote the letter from Ephesus and he knew all the craziness that went on in the Corinthian church. And I could only imagine how the how the church in Jerusalem kind of stubbed their, you know um, you know stubbed their nose at them and was like look at these people they're wacky probably what a lot of churches around here would say about us but I kind of like it that way but no you know it's one of those things where where Paul wanted to go he wanted to be a part of it he wanted to do it but he also knew as a Christian that we can make all the plans in the world but we also need to be flexible, right? And we see that in the next couple of verses here. It says, now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. And it may be that while I remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. So Paul, once again, is being practical here. He's saying, hey, I have these travel plans. This is what I plan on doing. This is what I'm hoping to do. And I've planned it all out on how I'm going to do it. But he leaves it up to the Lord, doesn't he? Those last four words, if the Lord permits. So he makes all the plans, which are great. It's great to plan. And we need the plan. We need to do our due diligence, right? But at the same time, we also need to then give those plans to the Lord and say, you know, if the Lord permits, this is what I'll do. You know, I gave the example of what happened yesterday at the funeral that Linda and I went to. It was for a guy who had been through U-turn and he OD'd and passed away. And so we were at the funeral and they had an open mic, you know, for people to talk. 
And I was going to, I had a verse, and I was going to get up and, and talk and had it all planned. So I was just kind of, a few of the family members were talking. And, and then, you know, while people were still kind of coming up, the pastor just kind of abruptly goes, okay, and so moving on. And I was like, okay, I guess the Lord didn't permit, you know, it was just one of those things, you know, and it was okay. It was fine, you know. I mean, I guess I could have went and tackled the pastor and said, no, I, I, I got a word, but no, it was just like, okay, well, you know, I still get credit for being willing. I was willing, and I wanted to say a few words and, you know, talk about it, uh, having been his pastor and going through his addiction with him and, and ministering to his family and stuff, but the Lord didn't permit it, so it just didn't happen. But we need to have that flexibility, don't we? You know, that, yes, we can make all these plans, but it's only if the Lord permits that should we do it? Or as it says in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, it says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Right? It's that, once again, it's that flexibility. If the Lord wills, I'll do this or I'll do that. You know, I'll make my plans, but then I'm going to give those plans to God and uh, allow Him to do it. But sometimes we can become so uh, stubborn about our plans, right? It's like, this is my plans, this is the way it's going to go, and I don't care what God does. I'm, I'm going to do it. It's my plans. I know this is the way I'm going to go, and it really doesn't matter. Perfect example is think about Jonah, right? <laughs> so we have Jonah, who absolutely hates the Ninevites. I mean, with a passion, right? And, and let's be honest, for good reason, they were some really evil people. And so the Lord says, go preach repentance to the Ninevites. And Jonah said, ain't happening, Lord. I hate the Ninevites. I don't want them to repent at all. I want you to bring judgment down on the Ninevites. Why would I go preach? Because I know if I go preach, they're going to repent, and then you're going to relent from your judgment, and that's just all bad, Lord. Right? <laughs> and so what's he do? He says, I'll run to Tarshish, the opposite end of the world, right? I'll ta I'm taking a ship, and I'm going the... I'm going the opposite way. And the Lord says, oh, really? Okay. So he's down sleeping in the bottom of the boat, and a storm comes up. Everybody's going to die. So the people on the boat, what do they do? They cast lots and figure out that it's Jonah who's causing the issue. So they wake Jonah. I'm like, man, what's going on here? What's... Why is the Lord going to kill us all? And he says, yeah, it's me. I'm running from the Lord. Throw me overboard and kill me. I'd rather die than preach to the Ninevites, right? And the Lord said, oh, really? You ain't dying. You're not getting off the hook that easy. So he brings the great fish. It swallows him up. So he's still stubborn. He's sitting in the belly of this great fish for three days. And then it says, then he prayed. So think about that. He's in this fish for three days with gastric juice, juices and, you know, in this 98.6 degree with the humidity and the seaweed and the nastiness. Right? Gross, right? You know, and could you imagine what it had been like? But it said it, he was there for three days. Then he prayed. It took him three days to become broken enough to go, okay, Lord. I'll go. It's better than being in the belly of this fish, right? And so then, of course, God, with his divine providence, pukes him up on the shore of Nineveh, and he preaches, and they repent, you know, and put on sackcloth and ashes and all that. And, you know, he still wasn't happy about the fact that God used him for this whole country to be to repent, right, for a period of time. But that's what happens when when we say, no, I want it this way. Not if the Lord permits, because God is going to accomplish His will, right? And God 
it can go a lot easier if we're more like Paul than we are Jonah, don't we? You know, hey, if the Lord permits, I'll go. Because there was many times through, through his journeys, through his ministry, that the Spirit just said, no, Paul, you're not going. Don't do it. He said, okay, I'm not going, you know. God didn't have to send a great fish to come swallow him up, did they? You know, for instance, in Acts 16, verses 6 and 7, it says, Now when they had gone through Phygeria in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. You know, just think about that for a minute. You know, they were like, hey, we're going through all of these cities. You know, how can we not preach to these places? You know, how can we not do what we've been called to do? But for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit forbid them to do it. So they didn't do it. You know, because, you know, that's the case too. Even when we're doing something that seems good, uh, if the Holy Spirit's not in it, then it's not going to have any fruit, right? And so Paul was sensitive. They were sensitive enough, even in this case, you know, of, of something as, as um, blessed as preaching. Um, the Spirit told them, not in Asia, not now. You ain't doing it. And so they didn't, which is a good thing. It would have been a waste of time. It wouldn't have been fruitful, right? And then it said after they had come to Misa, they tried to go in the Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit. So they, okay, so we're not going to preach in Asia. We'll go over to this place. And the Spirit said, nope, you're not going there either. You know, and, and Paul was okay with it, wasn't he? He said, okay, the Lord doesn't permit. I'm not going. I don't want to be any place that the Lord doesn't have me. I don't want to be in a place that's outside of the, the Lord's will. I don't want to be in, in any place that he doesn't permit me to be in. So being sensitive to the spirit like that's important, isn't it? We need to understand that, uh, that we have to be flexible in that way. Don't dig your heels in so tightly that you, know, you miss out on God's will, right? If, if he closes the door, don't try to kick it in. And if he opens the door, don't be stubborn enough not to go through it because it's not the door you wanted. No, Lord, I wanted to go through the red door, not the blue door. I ain't doing it until you open the red door. I'm going to kick the red door in. In fact, if I have to, I'll get a blowtorch and open the red door. You know, and then when you go through it, there's a cliff right there, right? You know, that's... No, we need, God closes a door, just let it be closed. Okay, Lord, there's a reason why you don't want me to go through it. I ain't going through it. But you open that door, which I didn't want to go through. It's open. I'm going through it, if the Lord permits. You know, that's, all, that's not as, always as easy as it seems, is it? You know, because we do all this planning and plotting of what we want, what, you know, Kevin's will be done. But when the Lord says, nope, you know, what's the battle going to be? Are we going to be more like Paul or are we going to be more like Jonah? Those are our two choices. I don't know about you, but it seems a lot easier to be like Paul than Jonah. Just saying, but I know we have quite a few Jonas in here. <laughs> One of them's behind the pulpit. <laughs> Verses 8 and 9. You know, I do good for a minute, and then I sidetrack myself and say something not bright, and then just keep going. So, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. I love this. You know, Paul says, you know, I, I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. He said, God has opened a door, and there's a great, there are many adversaries. You know, Paul wasn't afraid to, to take on a good fight, was he? You know, I, I love Love this. You know, most of us is like, I'm not going there. I'm not staying there. There's too many adversaries. But he was saying, those are exactly the people who need to hear the life changing message of the gospel are the ones who are adversarial towards it. There's a, there are, you know, there are many adversaries here. This is where I need to be, right? That's kind of like in this church. I can tell you something and you're all going to basically go, amen, I already know that. I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I know that I have a future and a hope. I know these things because I know the Lord, right? You guys ain't going to be adversarial to that. But those that are out in the, you know, the park and the different places that we go, you know, there's a lot of there that are adversarial towards the gospel. And that's where we need to be. And that's what Paul was saying, man. 
This is where I need to be. There, you know, there's a bunch of adversaries here. This is the place where that needs to hear the light or see the light of the gospel. These are the ones that, that need to know the truth. There's a lot that are adversarial to the gospel. Perfect. God's opened this door. Let's go. Right. And, and I love his heart there about that because, it, you know, he saw that as an open door. He understood it. You know, he wanted to go hang out with the churches. But Paul, Paul was told, no, there's a bunch of adversaries here. You need to go and tell them the truth. And of course he did. And then as it continues on and it says, and if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord, as I also do. So, you know, once again, you know, Timothy uh, was Paul's protege, wasn't he? He was, he was his spiritual son. It was the one that kind of had the same heart as Paul. You know, they connected in that way. And we read actually in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. You know, he's saying there's no one that has the same heart that I do, you know, who will care for your state. You know, is receive Timothy. You know, I, I love that. And as it goes on in this verse here, uh, it, in verse 11, it says, Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. You know, saying don't despise him because he's young. Don't despise him because he's not me or whatever the case may be, because uh, let's face it, you know, uh, like I had said earlier, the Church of Corinthians, it was messed up. It had lots of issues. It had lots of divisions. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of all these things. You know, he's saying, don't treat Timothy that way. He has the same heart as I do. And so, you know, he was, he was just exhorting the church that, you know, Treat him the way you would treat me, basically. And it says, now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come with you, come with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. You know, it's kind of interesting the way this is worded. It's almost like Paul, uh, Apollos was just kind of kicking back. It's like, eh, nah, not right now. I don't want to travel all the way to Corinth. It, it's just not convenient right now. I got other things to do. You know, it's um, the NBA playoffs are going on right now, and my team's still. No, that's not what it's saying here. It's basically the same idea um, that Paul was saying earlier. You know, it's like it's not convenient right now. The the I don't feel called to go right now, but I will go. You know, even though uh, you know it says that Paul strongly urged him to go, right? Because obviously, uh, Paul or Apollos was. Uh, really well, uh, you, you know, they really had a lot of reverence for Apollos, you know, because there was that group in the church that said, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, right? So they knew Apollos really well, and, and you know, they had a lot of reverence for him, but Apollos was like, ain't feeling it right now, you know, maybe later when the Spirit leads. Because we know, you know, that Apollos was definitely a man of God. He was a man of the word. We read in Acts 18, verse 24, it says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Right? So they knew him. They knew that he was, uh, you know, as it describes him here, mighty in the scriptures. He was an apologist. He knew the word. He knew how to teach the word. He knew how to reason from the word. And so they were really well, you know, acquainted with him. But he was like, no, just like Paul. No, the Lord's not willing right now. I'll come when it's convenient. When it's my time to go, I will go. Not a minute before. I don't care who, how strongly you urge me. It's not my time. You know, and, and that kind of speaks to us, too. It's like um, we have to be led, right? We have to be led by the Spirit not kind of, uh, you know, uh, pulled by other people. Well, we're doing this. You need to come do this too. No, I don't feel led to do it, you know. And I, I know as pastors like me and Aaron, we'll get that all the time. We need to have this kind of ministry. You know, it's basic, and my answer is usually always the same. Oh, really? So you're going to lead it? No, because what they're really saying is we need this kind of ministry and I want you to do it, you know. And it's like, no, I don't feel led. I do what I do, what God's called me to do. But if you feel like there's a need, then fulfill it. You know, go out and lead it, right? 
And that's kind of what Apollos was saying here. And then, then really, Paul turns to a couple of little exhortations that he gives the Corinthians church as he's winding up this letter. He says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Right? So he gives four little exhortations here. And the first one is just simply watch, right? Um, you know, be on the lookout, because let's be honest, Satan is going around. You know, Satan's having his way with this church. And in the city of Corinth, you know, be watchful, be on the lookout, be alert. Why? Because we know that we have an enemy. You know, that, as it says in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy, as compared to Jesus, who says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You know, he's saying, watch, be on the alert because the enemy wants to steal your joy. You know, he wants to kill and destroy your witness and your walk with the Lord. He's saying, be vigilant, you know, watch what you're doing. First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? Another word for this, for be sober would be self-controlled, right? He's saying be sober or self-controlled, knowing that there is an adversary out there that's trying to devour you, trying to devour your faith. And he brings it up and saying, not only be sober or self-controlled, but be watchful. So be self-controlled and be watchful. Why? Because there is an enemy out there that is trying to devour you, seeking to devour you. You know, it's kind of sobering, isn't it? So that's the first exhortation he gives us to watch. Be aware of your surroundings, spiritually speaking. Then he says, stand fast in the faith, right? Be firmly rooted in your faith. Be firmly rooted in, in uh, your knowledge of, of the Lord and, and where you stand with him. You know, as it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, stand, to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. He's saying the days are evil. You know, um, uh, make sure that you're able to stand and that you've done everything to stand, right? Make sure that you're watching, that you're vigilant, that you're equipped to be able to stand in these evil days that we live in. You know, and he was saying, not only should we stand, but we should be brave, right? You know, um, in other words, act like mature Christians. You know, be brave, understanding who you are in Christ. Understanding, you know, don't be babes. Don't act like babes in Christ, you know, because that's what he told the, the Corinthian church earlier in this epistle, right? You know, you act like children, basically. You know, he's saying, no, be mature. Act like mature believers. We read in, uh, about being brave, we read in 1 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind, right? He's saying, we don't have uh, anything to fear. We can be brave because God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, has he? No, he's given us a, a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. We have nothing to be fearful for. We have no reason to be a spiritual coward, do we? We have everything that we need to be brave in our faith because we're more than conquerors because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Amen? Amen. And then he says, be strong, you know, um, be strong. And it's obvious why we can be strong. We can be strong because of, what, of who we serve, not because of anything that we possess. Uh, once again, going back to Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, it's saying be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. See, we don't have to do it on our own. We don't have to do it uh, anything. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about the power of his might, right? That's how we can be strong. That's how we can stand against the wiles of the devil, right? Is through his strength, through his power, not through us. But it's him who's in us. That's how we can do it. So he encourages us in these little exhortations, even though it's, you know, these four little exhortations, it's a short verse, but there's a lot to it, isn't it? 
He's saying, watch, stand fast, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. I love that. But then he goes into the most important part of all of it, why we do what we do. In verse 14, he says, let all that you do uh, be done with love, right? That's the key to it. He's saying, you know, um, do all of these things and all that you do, everything that you do as a Christian or as a church, we should be doing it out of love, right? And if you remember about three chapters before, he gives us the definition of love. What should we be doing in love? What does love look like? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he, he defines it for us. He says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in inequity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. Right? He's saying if you're everything that you do, if you're doing it out of love, you're not going to be, you're going to be patient, you're going to be kind, you're not going to envy, you're not gonna boast, you're not gonna do all of these things, right? You're not gonna rejoice or be happy when somebody else uh, is in their inequity. Right, you're gonna, you're, but no, you're gonna bear all things. You're gonna believe all things. You're gonna hope all things. You're gonna endure all things. You're gonna esteem others above yourself. Right? That's what he's saying. That's what it means to do everything in love. Right? That's what he's talking about. Uh, you know, it, it, it's that sacrificial love that we're talking about here. And then as he continues on, he says, "I urge you, brethren." You know the household of Stephanus, that is, is the first fruits of Achaia, and that you have, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You know they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I can't think of a better way of showing that First Corinthians thirteen. Uh, love that's talking about, but by being devoted to the ministry of the saints, loving one another. And really that term devoted there could also be translated as addicted. You know, um, uh, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You know, to that point, to that compulsion of, of ministering to the saints. I love that, right? It's one of those things where if we're really showing love to one another, it becomes infectious, doesn't it? You know, if we, because if we as a family, if we can't love each other on these walls, in these walls, um, having so much in common, specifically the cross, Right. If we can't show love to one another, then how are we ever going to show love to those that are out in the community, to those who are difficult to love? Right. If we with all that we have that should unify us, if we can't show love in here, you know, how horrible is that witness? You know, how hor you know, why would. If somebody was looking in a church that didn't show love, you know, they'd, why would I want to go to that? I can have that in my current surroundings, you know? I can have the same things. There's no point in being there because there's no difference. But no, when we show love with, to one another, when we're addicted to ministering to each other, then it, it's powerful, isn't it? It's infectious. And that's what we should be, you know, that's what we should be asking God to give us the heart to do, to be addicted to ministry, ministering to each other. And it continues on and it says that you also submit to such, just talking about submitting to one another and, and submitting to the spiritual authority and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus and Achaeus for what was lacking on your part they supplied. You know, these three probably brought the letter from the church in Corinth, which Paul later explained. Remember how as we went through it, he answered a lot of questions that the Corinthian church had. You know, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And so Paul, partially, part of the reason why he wrote 1 Corinthians was to answer those questions, right? We don't know what those specifically, those questions were. And God didn't see fit to preserve that letter. But we know from the answer, or from the answers that Paul gave in 1 Corinthians, we know what 
a lot of those questions were, right? And, and so they probably delivered those letters. And then once again, on a practical side, it, you know, they helped financially uh, support him, right? They supplied him with uh, not only information and, and finances that he needed. In verse 18 and 19, it says, For they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. You know, once again, um, you know, Priscilla and, or Aquila and Priscilla were some of Paul's first uh, converts, right? These are kind of the first fruits of his ministry. And they were tent makers like Paul also. And, and we know when Paul went to Corinth, you know, they got him a job as a tent maker so that he wouldn't burden the church. Um, he could make his own money, make his own way. And so, uh, you know, it was one of those things where they labored alongside him. And Paul had a really an affinity for Aquila and Priscilla. And then it says, all the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Right, and this is kind of a cultural thing. We talked about this first service. You know, it's a holy kiss at the time. It was one of those things. They'd kiss them on the cheek or the forehead or whatever. And usually the women would kiss the women and the men, the men kind of thing. You know, it wouldn't work in our culture, right? You know, if I went and planted a kiss on somebody's wife, there's probably going to be a fist fight, you know, <laughs> in the church we live in, right? I, I mean, it's, if we're just being honest, it's not, it's a different culture. You know, for us, it would it'd be more like a, you know, if it was in our context, it would be greet one another with a holy hug, you know, because that's what we do, right? You know, it's just, it's just a cultural kind of thing. Um, and then as it continues, it says the salutation with my own hand, Paul. You know, um, it's kind of interesting as he writes this, you know, um, we don't always think about it, but like, these letters were written by a scribe. They weren't written necessarily by Paul's own hand. You know, he dictated them and somebody wrote them out for Paul. And there's a reason for that. You know, we feel that um, where Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh, he probably had eye problems, you know, where he really couldn't see. He, he didn't have very good vision. And we get some clues or some hints of that in, in the book of Galatians. For instance, in Galatians 4.15, it says, What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. You know, just meaning that you would have taken my eye condition from me and, and put it on yourself if you could have. You know, um, he, his eyes weren't very good. And then a little later on in, in Galatians, he said in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 11, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. You know, he is talking about the size of his letters, you know, because he was blind as a bat. He couldn't see. That's why we have large letter Bibles, right? For those of you who can't see very well, they're big print. That's what he's saying. I can't see. These are large letters. You can tell they're from my own hand because, you know, it was one of those deals where he's probably writing like this up close, you know, because he just couldn't see. So he's saying, you know, I've, I've written this in my own hand. You know, I, I just kind of found that interesting uh, as we were going through it. And, and like I said, most of these books were, you know, it was a scribe that wrote them out. Then comes to verse 22, where it says, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed, O Lord, come. You know, um, two things here, and, and we know this from all. Paul's writing as we've gone through it, and, and just as Christians in general, we know it. You know, that if you don't love the, the Lord, you're cursed, right? You're accursed, right? You know, if you do not love the Lord, you don't have much to look forward to, do you? You know, you're accursed. You're not going to spend eternity <laughs> with Jesus. But the thing about it is, is God is so gracious that he provides us with those opportunities to go from being accursed, right? Um, to being blessed. Those are the two choices. And it's all based on what we do with, uh, you know, the cross of Jesus, right? It's what we do with our relationship with the Lord. And then for those who are believers, we can echo this next thought. Oh, Lord, 
O Lord, come. You know, just in the early church, this was a greeting really coming from Aramaic where it says, for the Lord comes, you know, come, Lord. Um, we would say Maranatha, right? It was an early church greeting. It provided, it was kind of that word of hope and that word of comfort, realizing that the Lord was going to come, you know, and they greeted each other, reminding each other of that and encouraging each other of it. You know, O Lord, come. I love that because really if we're living a relationship that's right with the Lord, you know, we have that peace and comfort that only comes from him. Then we can say the same thing, can't we? Oh, Lord, come, you know, with the knowledge of knowing that, um, you know, we're we're his special people and that we're blessed in that way. Right. Because those are the two options. Either you can say in your heart, oh, Lord, come or you're accursed. There's no other options. You know, there is no plan B. It's either, oh, Lord, come or, uh, you know, accursed. And then I love the way he finishes this letter. And he finishes it with verse 23 and 24, where it says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. You know, he ends this letter with grace and love, doesn't he? You know, uh, after all of the correction and all of the things that he addressed with the Corinthian church, he ends it with grace and love, you know, and, which is exactly how God treats us, doesn't it? He treats us with grace and love. You know, he treats us uh, in such a way that we can understand that regardless of what we've done in the past, uh, you know, regardless of what's going on in our life, we can always tap into the grace and the love of Jesus. You know, that's really, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the hope that we have, knowing that it's because God's grace has covered all of our sins. It's because of God's grace that he poured out on the cross for us as he took our sins uh, you know, that we can have that hope and we can know that love of Christ. Amen. Amen. And so as we get ready to close, um, you know, just a couple of thoughts to think about. First and foremost, you know, um, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's a scary place to be in. You know, as the scripture said, uh, if we were to back up, you know, we're in a place of being accursed. But it's real easy to change that to being blessed. You know, all you have to do is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you go from being accursed to being blessed. It's that simple. It's not a hard thing. We don't have to clean up ourselves and, and do all these things that come to God. No, we come to God and then he does the rest. He does the work. He's already accomplished the work on the cross anyways. And so there's going to be pastors and elders up here to pray with anybody who needs pray, prayer. There's going to be pastors and elders up here to talk to you. If you've never accepted Jesus, come talk to one of them. Let them tell you about it. You know, or if you've kind of stepped away, they'll be here to pray with you uh, to get you back where you need to be. So as we sing this final, final song, like I said, there will be pastors and elders up here available for prayer. And then just one last thing before we pray. On Wednesday, we'll be going through Genesis chapter 6. So research from verse 2, uh, who the sons of God are. And then next Sunday, we'll start the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Amen? Amen? All right. With that being said, let's go before the Lord one last time. And then Brian will, and the worship team will lead us in a final song and we'll be excused. So Lord, we come before you and God, we're so grateful for your word. God, we're so grateful for your grace and love. Um, God, I'm thankful that where our sin abounds, your grace abounds much more. And so, God, uh, just help us to be people that are sensitive to your spirit, Lord, and that we only do what you will us to do, Lord. May we be more like Paul and less like Jonah. So, God, we just uh, give this all to you now, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.
you all. May you go out in the strength and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and join us back again on Wednesday. Don't forget you can still get prayer up here if you need prayer.